Ramasamsarapavadi <laughs> All glories to some of the bodies, all glories to some of the bodies, all glories to some of the bodies, all glories to Sri Guru and Sri Gurang, all glories to Sri Prabhupada. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Nama Om Vishnu Banaya Krishna Bhristai Buddha De Shimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharane Narvase Shashunya Vadi Pastachadesha Tarane Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Sri Dvanda Gadadhar Shivasti Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Reading from Srimad Bhavan Kanda 1 Chapter 3 Verse 40 Satu samsravayam asa Maharajam parikshatam Pareopa vishtam gangayam Paritam paramashabhi
Sa, son of Vyasadev, to again, from Savayam Asa, make them audible, Maharajam, unto the Emperor, Parikshatam, of the name Parikshat, Praya Upavishtam, who sat until death without food or drink, Gangayan, on the bank of the Ganges, Paritam, being surrounded, Paramarshabi, by great sages. Translation, Sukadev Goswami, the son of Vasudev, in his turn, delivered the Bhagavatam to the great emperor, Parikshit, who sat surrounded by sages in the bank of the Ganges, awaiting death without taking food or drink. Report all transcendental messages are received properly in the chain of deceptic succession. This deceptic succession is called Parampara. Unless, uh, therefore, Bhagavatam or any other Vedic literature are received through the Parampara system, the reception of knowledge is not bona fide. Vasudev delivered the message to Sukadev Goswami from Sukadev Goswami, Sutta Goswami received the message. One should therefore receive the message of Bhagavatam from Sutta Goswami or from his representative and not from any irrelevant interpreter. Emperor Pariksha received the information of his death in time and he at once left his kingdom and family and sat down on the bank of the Ganges to fast till death. All great sages, rishis, philosophers, mystics, etc. went there uh, due to his imperial position. They offered many suggestions about his immediate duty and at last it was said that he would hear from Sukadev Goswami about Lord Krishna. Thus the Bhagavatam was spoken to him. Sripad Shankaracharya, who preached Mayavada philosophy and stressed the impersonal feature of the Absolute, also recommended that one must take shelter at the lotus feet of Lord Sri Krishna, or there is no hope of gain from debating. Indirectly, Sripad Shankaracharya admitted that what he had preached in the flowery grammatical interpretation of the Vedanta Sutra could not help one at the time of death. At the critical hour of death, one must recite the name of Govinda. This is the recommendation of all great transcendentalists. Sukadev Goswami had long ago stated the same truth uh, that at the end, one must remember Narayan. That is the essence of all spiritual activities. In pursuance of this eternal truth, Srimad Bhagavatam was heard by Emperor Pariksit and it was recited uh, by the able Sukadev Goswami, and both the speaker and the receiver of the messages of Bhagavatam were duly delivered by the same uh, medium. So here we see the, um, I would say, the transmission of uh, Bhagavatam, uh, transmission or handing down parampara is often emphasized in the Bhagavatam and other Vedic literatures. Uh, we'll see it at the very end of the Bhagavatam, 12th canto, in the very last chapters. Again, the whole history is related. Yeah? Of course, it starts with Supreme Lord himself speaking to Brahma, who speaks to Narada, who speaks to Vyasa, who speaks to Sukadev, who speaks to Pariksha. And then meanwhile, Sutta also hears, yeah? and then he keeps it to the sages at Naimisaranya. So that's basically the parampara as we see it. So as Prabhupada points out in the purport, uh, the reason this type of parampara is repeated several times in the Bhagavatam is because this is the system of uh, transmitting knowledge. We do have another parampara, that's a diksha parampara which is similar because uh, just like the teachings have to be given in a succession, so mantra also has to be given succession. So Diksha mantras are given from one person to another who gives to another who gives to another. And therefore we have a Diksha Parampara system. Uh, so in both cases, uh, 
parampara is necessary because subject matter is spiritual. Whether it's mantra or teachings, we need some sort of uh, what, transmission mechanism. So it goes from person to person. So that is what the parampara is. We're going from person to person. Ah, so in this way, uh, the, uh, not just the mantra, but the teachings also must come in the right line. Huh? And it's not just Bhagavatam, we see that all teachings will come in a similar line. So we see that uh, Veda Vyas divided the Vedas up, then he gave it to his disciples, and then they gave it to their disciples, and they gave it to their disciples in this way. The and different branches of the Vedas were handed down. This is also described at the end of the Bhagavatam. So again, we have a, a parampara of the Vedas themselves. And of course, the Puranas, Itihasas, etc. are also carried on in some sort of parampara. So this is always emphasized. Uh, and uh, we can ask the question, uh, why is it necessary? Particularly, if we have that knowledge available in book form and with commentaries, so then why do we need someone also to speak it? Yeah. So that's a question. Of course, now we have, we don't even need books. We have audio recordings, we have videos, we have uh, MP3 players and so many things. We got uh, uh, books on um, internet, etc. So. Uh, uh, the technology is such that uh, we don't need an intermediary anymore to teach us because we get the books readily available. And of course, in the past, there was some necessity of an individual person teaching because there were no books. There was nothing. Yeah? Of course, uh, they had, later on, they had palm leaf manuscripts, so that's the best they could do. But they're very perishable and they also take time to write and not readily available for everybody. So somebody may have a copy of the Bhagavatam written out in palm leaves. So I don't know how long, how many <laughs> volumes you have to carry around with you, but it's a, it's a pretty big affair to have the whole Bhagavatam in palm leaf manuscripts. You know, it's it's uh, maybe the size of half a room or something. How are you going to take it around with you? <laughs> uh, how are you going to store it, whatever? Uh, who, uh, so it's, and of course it takes money also to print these things by handwritten things. So not commonly available. So mainly, of course, they would be in libraries, king's libraries or wealthy men's libraries. They would have such uh, manuscripts. So therefore not available for everybody. They don't know anything. Bhagavad Gita, how are you going to learn Bhagavad Gita? There's no books available. Huh? Unless you get a palm leaf manuscript, which is to say rare. If you're wealthy, you could get one, but otherwise, no. Hmm. So the other way, of course, is by hearing. Huh? So that was the common method uh, to hear and memorize <laughs> and then understand the meaning. Huh? And previous to the you know, Itihasas and Puranas, there was the Vedas. Hmm? So again, it's all, um, it's more restrictive. Yeah. So they're not available for anybody. And the, the, the guru is not going to speak to anybody unless you're very, very qualified. Yeah. Uh, so in this way, the knowledge was also uh, not available in books, but also exclusive because it was not taught to everybody. Now, of course, the Vedas are more restrictive. Only the three upper varnas can learn. Huh? Uh, so Puranas and um, Mahabharata are more readily available. Still, no, no books or anything. So basically, you have to go to uh, Guru to get. So just as a, practically speaking, hmm, oral transmission was the medium. Hmm. So as, that's as far as just learning the text. Besides that, is understanding and getting the meaning of the text. That's another thing. So, of course, the two things would go together. And a person would not teach the Vedas unless he also taught the meaning. So that you're, otherwise it's useless. So what is the use of memorizing all the Vedas, but you don't know what they mean? So you also have to know the meaning of the Vedic texts and how to apply those mantras. 
in particular instances. So all that is to be taught also. Hmm? So that again comes through the guru. Hmm? So there's always an emphasis therefore upon the guru to teach, etc. So we have all these verses that, you know, the guru is like God and you have to treat him like God. And um, through him you're going to get the revelation of the Vedas, etc. So it's more or less true because there's no one else you could go to. <laughs> and you're not going to get it from a book anyway. So you would have to go to a person to get that knowledge. But the important thing to realize here is the person who is teaching is also qualified because he learned from a qualified person and he became authorized by that. Yeah. So therefore, we have an authorized person teaching, not just he knows and he explains the meaning, but it's authorized meaning and coming down in parampara. Yeah. Yeah. So this is some guarantee that um, the knowledge is transmitted correctly and with the correct meaning and application. Yeah. Another musical system for that reason. This parampara is not a diksha parampara, obviously. This is a shiksha parampara. Yeah? And this is the parampara which is emphasized in the Upanishads. Uh, they are getting knowledge from another person who is not a diksha guru. Sometimes it's a king teaching some sage or something like that. So it's not a diksha guru, really. It's just a, a sage teaching another person or the brahmacharis are learning from the uh, teacher in the guru call. Again, it's not the diksha guru, he's just the teacher. Huh? But in order to get the knowledge, they have to respect him like the Supreme Lord, whatever, see him as non different from the Lord. Yeah. So that tradition of uh, parampara is emphasized, but as in this case also, it is a shiksha parampara, not a diksha parampara at all. And uh, here we see the, the parampara again is. Uh, uh, Vasudev, Sukadev, uh, to Pariksha, etc. And uh, the uh, system is the proper respect is given. Uh, the uh, hearer or disciple is qualified uh, in the eyes of the guru or speaker, and therefore the speaker will speak to that person because he knows he's qualified to get the knowledge and not misuse it. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was uh, there's some, um, we could say, uh, checks and balances also involved here to see that the knowledge is transmitted to a proper person uh, who will use it properly. And so we have an emphasis upon such a uh, system coming down. Uh, so in this way the, uh, the, the knowledge is, this is the traditional knowledge. Uh, however, we do see that as time has gone on, uh, after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, of course, still they were using palm leaf manuscripts, whatever like that, even at that time. Somewhat difficult to get. Yeah? And um, uh, therefore, uh, we say necessity. Hmm? But when the, within the last few hundred years, then, uh, they made books. They got printing presses from the British, and they made books. Yeah? So in Bhaktivinoda's time, Bhaktivinoda Thakur's time, then they published books. And your books were available of all different things. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur himself made great effort to publish a lot of these Vaishnava manuscripts, the Gaudiya ones particularly, but other things, even some Sri Vaishnava or Madhva scripts also, he would he published those things as well. Uh, so within the last few hundred years, therefore, the texts themselves have become more available which opens up the audience so that it's not just you learn through the guru but then you could just buy a book in the bookstore and <laughs> read it that way or go to the library and read the book there so then it's open and there's no filtering process of going through a particular guru to get the information uh, you can just pick up the book out of the library and read it or if your bookstore you can buy it and read it so in that way the knowledge is more readily available <coughs> So, this would do away with the necessity of having that parampara because it's more available in that sense. Huh? So yes, in that sense more available, but the other aspect, as I said, is not just the only through the guru because there were no books, so we have books that is more available, but still the meaning and the use has to be there. 
so that would come through a person teaching it. Huh? So in this way, not only we have book, but we still have the necessity of learning um, the, the actual meaning and getting the uh, use of particular uh, instructions there. Huh? So again, we do have a necessity of going to a particular person. So therefore, we do have another necessity of parampara again. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, then, in order to get the meaning, then we have commentaries. So now the commentaries are available also. So we have all the commentaries of Jiva Goswami and Rupa Goswami and Satan Goswami and Baladeva Jiva and so many people. So then in that sense we, we can get the meaning without having the devotee because we're getting the meaning there. And that's also true. So things are more available now. But still, even if you read the commentaries, still you're going to have questions. <laughs> Yeah. So this is why they do have universities. Obviously, you can just go and read all the medical books, but that doesn't make you a doctor. Huh? So you do need some teacher uh, to point out the relevant things and also things that are not in the books even, uh, to give practical guidance, etc. Mm. So in spite of all the commentaries, in spite of all the books, in spite of the bookstores and libraries and internet and whatever, still, we do require the practical guidance. Uh, so, uh, in this way, the, we still have a necessity of the devotee. So the devotee never disappears at all from the scene. That's how, and the devotee is always there. Uh, so in this way, uh, the, uh, we never do away with a parampara system, uh, whether it is diksha or shiksha, uh, or with an emphasis on shiksha here, an emphasis on shiksha in Bhaktisiddhanta is tracing out the line also. Uh, we have a, a shiksha line. So, in this way, uh, there's still a necessity of handing down the knowledge uh, in a proper way. Uh, of course, then we have Srila Prabhupada's books, so then Srila Prabhupada's books are there is the authority for ISKCON. So if we have those books, do we need anyone else to teach us also? And we can say, well, everything is in the books, so we don't need anything. <laughs> hmm? But then we do have problems because we read the books and then devotees have arguments about what does it mean? <laughs> and what is the conclusion? Uh, so even if everything is made clear, of course the Goswamis tried to do this also, but still there are things that are a little bit ambiguous that you have to argue over. Uh, so even with Prabhupada's book, as clear as possible, but still there are points that are controversial and there's disagreements about it means this or it means that. Uh, and you could go on arguing forever. So in this way there are always points that have to be uh, discussed, uh, elucidated, explained nicely according to tradition, uh, scripture, realization, etc., and practicality in the modern world. Uh, so in this way, there's always a necessity of devotees to put things into practice. Uh, uh, which brings up a point is that uh, scripture is eternal, uh, scripture is unchanging, um, truth is absolute, uh, so we can't change anything in the scripture, and we shouldn't change the meaning, try to get the exact meaning. But Time changes. <laughs> so 500 years ago is not the same as now. 100 years ago is not the same as now. So the application of the teachings also changes to some degree. Now we can't say everything changes because then there will be nothing left after a few generations. Huh? And so there are certain principles that never change, but some details are always going to change. Yeah? So we have Nam Sankirtan as the process, so it doesn't change whether it's Lord Chaitanya's movement or now. And what is it? It means congregational chanting of the Holy Name. People get together and chant the Holy Name. Of course, Lord Chaitanya emphasized Hare Krishna mantra. Of course, other, we can use other mantras also. So actually, in Lord Chaitanya's time, they used many uh, verses and words and names of the Lord, not just Hare Krishna. And you'll see many songs or just the names of the Lord or whatever like that. So their kirtan was slightly different from our kirtan. <laughs> <laughs> and of course they use different tunes, different melodies, different ragas, etc. Uh, usually very slow, uh, classically oriented also. Huh? Uh, so 
uh, that is quite different from what we have nowadays in the modern world. It's quite different. Huh? Uh, and of course, then we have modern world. We have different instruments. Uh, then we have uh, microphones. They didn't have microphones then, so you have microphones. Then we have you know all sorts of uh, electronic media. Uh, so all sorts of different things available in the modern world. So then even Sankirtan itself, though it's the main process, it will also get altered due to the particular circumstances now. And what will happen in the next uh, 100 years, we don't know. Yeah? Uh, uh, what uh, type of mechanisms will have for communication might be quite different from what we have now. Because what was 20 years ago is not what is here now. Uh -huh. uh, 20 years ago, did they have Walkmans 20 years ago? Or was that 30 years ago, Walkmans? What is a Walkman? You know what a Walkman is? It's a little tape recorder like this. <laughs> but they don't even have those cassette tape recorders on the market anymore. <laughs> but then they switched to CDs or something after that, yeah? But now they don't even have CDs, I don't think. Now it's all like MP3s and things like this now. So uh, that's what happened in the last 20 years. So many advances in the last 20 years. So what happens in the next 10 years or 20 or 30 years, we don't know in terms of communications or whatever. Mm -hmm. Hard to figure out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So similarly, we have uh, now we have Zoom. They discovered Zoom <laughs> during COVID. They're forced to use Zoom. So now half of the classes are on Zoom. Uh, uh, with the um, Bhakti Shastri is on Zoom. Uh, <laughs> I think the deity worship course on Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, everything on Zoom now. <laughs> so you can have RT on Zoom and uh, <laughs> Shamastami on Zoom and uh, um, classes on Zoom whatever, uh, probably initiation on Zoom also, yeah? Yeah, initiation on Zoom, so uh, things have uh, changed in the last so many years. Huh? Uh, and so what's going to happen in the future, we don't know. Yeah? But never the certain principles are there and we follow those principles, but there's going to be some changes. And when the changes take place, um, we also have to make sure that we don't lose the essence of everything, yeah? because that's always possible. Yeah. So that is why there's a continuity through the person. Yeah? So it is the people that, in spite of all the changes everywhere around, uh, there is a constant because of the people. And what is the constant in the people? They are devotees. Hmm? Because they are devotees, then the meaning that they give to the Bhagavatam is bona fide. Uh, we take the meaning from the devotee, that is nectar, we take it from the materialist, it is poison. Same words, same verses, everything same, but a different effect, ultimately, because it's a devotee. Hmm? Yeah. So uh, the devotee himself may change many things. Yeah, but because of his position of being a devotee and his realization, etc., then certain things remain in the parampara and they continue into the future, yeah? in spite of all the different changes. Yeah? So therefore the idea of a parampara is still valid in the modern world, in spite of the fact that necessity has decreased in one sense because of communications, books, availability of knowledge, etc., still. The devotee is always necessary to some degree or other. Hmm. Okay. Maharaj, nowadays uh, even to learn Vedic mantras for rituals, we have Pata Sala, one has to undergo 18 years of uh, study. We have because the print media is very advanced by technology. Uh, even even during Rama's time, Brahmanas were there, they were performing ritual. Even Krishna's time, Brahmanas were there performing ritual. They learned the Veda, Vedic Mantra, which is a very, very vast study. But uh, So the Brahmanas memory was very powerful than the modern Kali Yuga Brahmana. Or the, the process of only hearing process was existing even during Dwapara Yuga. Hmm? In no, no, the hearing process of learning Vedic Mantra. Yeah. During uh, Dwapar Yuga, during Ramachandra rule and even beginning of Kali Yuga, Krishna's rule, there is no print media. How the Brahmanas learned all mm. the Vedic ma mantra rituals, which is a very vast subject. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, so the Brahmanas are more higher level than the Kali Yuga Brahmanas after Krishna's departure? Well, obviously people in Satya Yuga lived much longer lives also. <laughs> and they were sattvic. People in Kali Yuga, tamasic. Treta Yuga, a little bit contaminated. Warpa Yuga, more. And then Kali Yuga, the most contaminated, less intelligent, etc. So ability to learn also is much less, in general, of people. So therefore, even the, everybody's affected. All the varnas are affected. Uh, and, and there's only one varna in Satya Yuga. Everybody's pure. But then we got introduction of, var introduction of varnas in Treta Yuga because the gunas start manifesting. And then by the time we get to Kali, Tamaguna is most prominent. So therefore, the ability of people to absorb the Vedas is going to be much more difficult. Huh? Uh, so not difficult for people in Satya Yuga. So they can learn all the Vedas, no problem. Hmm? So now, maybe it is a struggle to learn one Veda. <laughs> we have Ekavedi, but we have Chaturvedis, yeah? So originally they learned all four Vedas. Huh? But now they can, maybe it's rare you're going to get one Ekavedi, even one who knows all of the one Veda, all the verses and all the whatever supplements, etc. Huh? So, more difficult nowadays, much more difficult, definitely. Uh, but still, uh, at least the attempt is there to do something and preserve it, that's good. But nevertheless, it's much more, say, deteriorated than in previous ages. What is this regarding the parampara? Like, see, in Chaitanya Chaitamita, you explained that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was teaching to Prabhu Goswami and Sonata Goswami and telling that, you know, uh, you write books on devotional life, okay. So, but we see the, the teaching what Rupa Goswami and Sonata Goswami got from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, it was limited. But whereas when they teach others, that is unlimited through the books only. Then how can we understand that what they are giving that is actually the, uh, they have got from uh, Sri Chaitanya Chaitanya uh, Parampara means Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Because only few days only they stayed with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Mm -hmm. How do we know? Yeah, how do you know? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, it is all based on faith. That's all. <laughs> we don't know because we weren't there. We didn't hear what Lord Chaitanya told them or whatever. No? No? But uh, it's a, a matter of faith not only for us, it's also a matter of faith of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Even if he didn't tell them everything, he had faith that they would write things which were proper. Huh? So he had faith in them. Of course, we could say that Lord Chaitanya himself is Supreme Lord and he goes on his Nitya Siddha, so there's no problem anyway. Knowledge is going to be perfect. But uh, based upon their, the faith, Lord Chaitanya had faith in them as uh, good followers that they would expound the uh, knowledge properly. Now, of course, there is a little safeguard there because they have to confine themselves to scripture. They don't concoct. Hmm? So, in other words, Lord Chaitanya wanted them to use scripture itself to expound Lord Chaitanya's teachings. So, therefore, they do have to stick to the teachings. Of course, you could use Vedas, Upanishads, Brahma Sutra, etc. But most of it, they stuck to Bhagavatam because that's the authoritative work that Lord Chaitanya emphasized. So therefore they concentrate on Bhagavatam and then giving the meaning of Bhagavatam. And then they're supposed to uh, explain it according to uh, Lord Chaitanya's teachings. Which isn't difficult because we can say you take the direct meaning as much as possible. Where there's contradictions then you resolve it, etc. So. For Bhagavatam, not so difficult because we do know that the ultimate essence is worship Krishna and process of bhakti yoga and prema, so it's not so difficult. A question regarding this uh, Shri Prabhupada. Um, I think Prabhupada also made a statement that everything is there in my book. Mm -hmm. Everything is there in my book. You know, it's also, I think Prabhupada also made a statement. But now, see, even in the book, also there's a contradictory statement. Mm -hmm. And so now, so suppose now that how to take that contradictory statement because the person who are explaining this contradictory statement, mm -hmm. and how can you say they are right? Because 
different people are explain the same contradictory men in different way mm-hmm. so it's de- not yeah. confusion yeah. over confusion no so it depends uh, so uh, the contradictions in scripture itself uh, like in bhagavatam they get resolved by the uh, goswamis basically yeah? so that there is no contradiction ultimately it looks looks like a contradiction and there is no contradiction huh? and they will also do that uh, to some degree with uh, upanishads uh, so they will explain that brahman does not just mean impersonal brahman like in brahma sutras it means krishna <laughs> so in this way they explain that which is not just the goswamis even uh, nimbarka says the same thing so huh? So, a lot of the contradiction in scripture itself will be resolved by the uh, acharyas of different sampradayas. There may be contradictions of conclusions between different sampradayas on details. Principles? No. Details? Maybe they will have some minor things. So, those are subject to, let's say, eh, debate or whatever among Vaishnavas, but not really so important. Uh, So, uh, then the contradictions you're speaking are what contradictions were in Prabhupada's books? In ISKCON we have many gurus uh, they explain the contradictory subject matter from the Shila Prabhupada and they're giving mm-hmm. their own opinion okay and yeah. one is contradict to others yeah 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 so yes uh, we can emphasize one thing or we emphasize the other thing yeah Prabhupada said this or Prabhupada said that uh, Prabhupada said both things. <laughs> so, therefore, you can't say one is better than the other, unless Prabhupada conclusively says that in one place. Uh, just like all bhakti is good, but then we also say that Nam Sankirtan is prominent, most prominent, and it's obvious by context, ultimately. But then Prabhupada will often say, do this or do that, and whatever. Uh, so, uh, some of it is resolved by intelligent scrutiny of the context. Uh, so we can't just take isolated statements. Hmm? Others, uh, maybe because they are details, uh, then uh, again you may, may not be able to resolve it. Uh, because Prabhupada may have changed his mind. He makes one statement in 1965, another in 70, and another in 75. And there may be all three different statements. So it may be he changed his mind. But is the last one the conclusive one or not? Maybe he changed his mind one year later, but he didn't say it. So we don't, sometimes we don't know in certain cases. So these are not the, uh, usually a, statements of tattva so much as policy statements or uh, particular uh, emphasis, that's all. More than, you know, uh, things based on scripture. Hmm? So some things we can d- look at the context very closely, and then we may discard one or at least give equal emphasis to both. Uh, other things may not resolve on our own. We don't know. It's hard, difficult to say. So, so Manaj, maybe in that case, the issue which uh, Prabhu is talking about, maybe a similar policy as uh, you were explaining yesterday about the pur- uh, the Puranas. So there may be some statements but they may be uh, relative statements and uh, they can be interpreted with term, in terms of absolute principles. Like there is this, uh, I remember we attended a program, Leeds program and there was this one whole session about Varnashram. And there was so much emphasis laid on that, that you know, uh, that it's very important to go back to the farms and uh, live that kind of life. So, uh, so I felt that there are certain devotees who are very attracted to that kind of lifestyle and they also over a period of time move into that kind of uh, but then many devotees need to stay back in the cities in the villages and uh, take part this preaching movement so then what's the point so i was just adding to what he was saying that uh, like the puranas there are there so there are some relative statements or their secondary statements as you use the word yeah uh, so they have to be considered in that way yeah yeah well, of course, for Puranic statements, usually we're dealing with tattvas, and uh, some scriptures are stronger than others. So, Gyanakanda is stronger than Karmakanda. So, we'll take the Upanishadic statements as superior to the Karmakanda statements. 
in terms of Puranas, we'll take the Sattvic Puranas over the Tamasic or Rajasic Puranas in terms of who to worship and what to do, etc. Like that. So there's some easy things there. But these are not actually, you know, whether it's Varnashram or no Varnashram, that's not really a Tattva statement at all. <laughs> it's just a policy statement. So sometimes Prabhupada emphasized, sometimes he didn't emphasize. If he emphasized so much, why did he build all the temples and cities? <laughs> huh? There's only one farm community, I think, in this time that was New Vrindavan, but otherwise everything was in the cities. So why did he concentrate on the cities and emphasize that? And so that's one thing you could say that, yeah, he talked about it a lot, but he actually didn't do that in many places. Huh? Uh, now the other thing, of course, is that if you do do farms, the tendency is then you lose the preaching. <laughs> because you're off on a farm. Everybody's on a farm doing something, then you, you no preaching at all. Huh? So maybe that's why Prabhupada is interested in the cities, because more preaching there. So that's, that's the counter thing. So yes, you can have a farm, but then the other idea, of course, of farms, when you get into it, then the only way you can preserve a farm ultimately is to isolate yourself. Because otherwise, you just run to the city <laughs> from the farm. You run to the city, keep running to the city because it's one hour away. So every time you need something, you run to the city to get it and bring it back. <laughs> so you know, but if you want to be completely self-sufficient community, you have to isolate yourself. You isolate yourself, then where's the preaching in that sense? Huh? So that's a little bit of a problem. I don't know how they resolve that one. Huh? That's one thing. Um, in long terms, then yeah, you do have to isolate yourself. And that's what they do in America in certain communities like the Amish and other uh, Christian groups. They've isolated themselves for several hundred years from the rest of society. They, they just, no communication, nothing. They use horse buggies and still like that. Uh, the uh, farms, etc. Uh, isolated communities. And they don't associate with the rest of the world at all. And they still wear the old clothes of 200 years ago, everything. But is that what we want? Is that what Prabhupada wanted or not? Do we want to isolate ourselves like that and wear the clothes of 500 years ago and, and do the things like that 500 years ago? We have to ask questions, serious questions like that. So, well, Otherwise, if you do have a community, then how do you keep it going without getting too much influence by the city? That would be another problem that you have to solve somehow, which I don't know if they've solved at all like that. And Maharaj, you were talking about um, how Zoom and the new technology in Zoom is changing things. But recently there was a research where uh, the scientists studied the movement of the eye and they had put an EEG on the head and these people were interacting over uh, Zoom and then they had in-person interaction. So they saw that when there was an in-person interaction, there was much deeper stimulation of the brain oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. compared yeah. to what was happening on Zoom. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So yeah, uh, electronic media, etc. is there, but again we could say it can't replace personal interaction. Uh, so that's just like maybe a neurological <laughs> proof <laughs> that your brain is not so activated by this uh, non-personal thing. Something can happen, definitely. You can accomplish something, but maybe not everything that way. So then you do need the personal interaction also. Yeah, that's just a nice proof of that. And Maharaj, our experience also is that, yes, some amount of knowledge can be transferred. Of course, another thing you could say that even lectures or whatever on Zoom are not so effective as personal lectures. Yeah. That would be the conclusion. So that would says all of Prabhupada's lectures also, are they potent or not? <laughs> yeah, that would be a controversial question to ask. And of course, obviously, if Prabhupada is here in person, you would prefer to hear him in person rather than to hear a lecture or videotape, obviously. So there is a personal presence there also that is not, you know, available through the audio or whatever, audio or audio-visual, etc. So, <laughs> so Maharaj, our experience also was that um, there is some amount of knowledge transfer, but when it comes to uh, transfer of practices and culture, so that is where it really lacks. So we have a very clear distinction in terms of a devotee who comes to the temple, takes up Krishna consciousness, connects with the local Bhakti Rusha. So his grooming, the way we see in Iskon devotee, compared to one who has been groomed over internet or, uh, you know, there is a lot of difference in that. Mm -hmm. So that way, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, thinking that what you were saying is that human touch, devotee touch is so extremely important. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, if there's no other alternative, then that has to happen. This example of, um, I think, in um, Mongolia, 
<laughs> some people start, start hearing some lectures or like that or whatever. I don't know how they got the information, but they started practicing on their own <laughs> from somehow. Maybe they got some books or something and they started practicing in Mongolia. Later on, people discovered that they were actually interested in Krishna consciousness, so they went there and visited them and they started cultivating. But they, they started all on their own because somehow they got the inspired to do it. So it's not that, you know, the non-personal thing is completely useless, but at a certain point, yes, you do need the uh, persons also. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, Mahaprabhu gave Hare Krishna Mahamantra 500 years back after his appearance. What people were uh, chanting the mantras before that? What were they chanting? What, yeah, what people were chanting before appearance of uh, Mahaprabhu during this Kali Yuga. Oh, yeah. So, um, well the main process for everybody, uh, of course, Bhakti was there, but a lot of it was deity worship. And then for deity worship, you had private mantras so that wasn't chanted loudly. Now, of course, there were kirtans. I think of Sri Vaishnava, they had some sort of kirtan, and maybe in Madhva, there was Purandara and others who had kirtans, etc. But it was not the main process. So the main process was through deity worship and the deity mantra through Diksha. So Sankirtan becomes the major process through Chaitanya Mahaprabhu.